<laughs> Two weeks this time. I mean, I did. I mean, do this. All right, hello everyone. Oh, I'm too close. <laughs> Sorry. Um, welcome to Design Media Arts uh, lecture series. And I am Professor Rebecca Mendes. I'm very happy to introduce John Thakra. I first met John over 20 years ago at a conference in Seattle. He invited me to attend a conference he was director of in Amsterdam called Doors of Perception, which took place early November in 1995. The event, and I am sure, John, you get this often, the event changed my life. But it really did, in many ways. And it was at Doors that I met Adam, who after 20 years later, an ocean and a continent farther away is still my partner in life and work. That was great. <laughs> it was, and it was in the Doors um, on matter. That was, uh, and it was also the workshop. That was beautiful. Throughout the past decades, John Thackera has remained an essential guide for me to inspire and realize a sustainable future for the common good. Through his blog, books, events, and talks, he shares knowledge that offers a vision of new opportunities and a good idea how to harness these towards, decision, to, towards decisive action, which is, I think, what it is key, towards making something that one can take action. John is the author of a new book called How to Thrive in the Next Economy, Designing Tomorrow's World Today. In a review in the, in the New Scientist, science fiction writer Bruce Sterling writes, this book is a thoughtful plan for a better and very different world, but it's, not one that we, but, but it's one that we don't deserve, can't have, and won't get. And I refuse, refuse to believe in that. So tonight's talk, I trust that John will open our eyes to new concepts and different perspectives, and that he will inspire you to go forth and make it so. I want to thank the lecture's co-sponsors, which is UCLA Art Science Center and Lab, and the Environmental Humanities at UCLA. And with um, no further ado, John, John Thacker. Yes. Thank you. I actually wanted to call the book uh, How to Be a Slime Mold, but my publisher, very wonderful man called Jamie Camplin, said, don't be sad, John. You can publish a book with that title for your 10 friends, but not if Clemson and Hudson are expected to do any work about it. But I must say that having, the book has been out for three or four months now, and I've kind of talked to lots of people, I think the notion of um, any book or conversation or encounter that explores not just what can happen, but how we can make things change against what seems to be a background of really gruesome bad news all the time. I think the notion of small things that change the bigger picture, I think, is still valid. But I, did, I was too late to, to uh, persuade Thompson Hudson, but thank you, um, UCLA, for tolerating this rather odd title. Although there's a mystery about who it was that had an argument with me about the spelling of the word mold which in English is M-O-U-L-D, and here apparently is M-O-L-D, so I apologize for that inconvenience. But I thought I'd just say a few words about the notion of why anybody would write a book about anything, never mind a book about something like, you know, the world we're in and how to transition to something different and better and more just and more livable. Um, because uh, I've brought, written quite a lot over the years. I've done a number of books and other things, and I used to work in book publishing. I know the futility and the madness of um, even embarking on such a thing. This is one of 12 uh, Amazon book distribution points just in Europe. And I don't know what there is, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different titles. A new book is published in England, English language every three minutes uh, to be added to the ones that have been published every three minutes for the last... Uh, dozens of years, and I think it's not an unreasonable question, is what possible impact on anything can the next book have? Um, particularly when you think that mine is probably there from the left, I don't know, made that up, obviously. 
Um, but in all my life, I've done very often books that I've written have had the word design in it for historical reasons, and bookshops and uh, catalog compilers and people running databases don't know where to put the book in their own catalogs, let alone in the Amazon warehouse. But the point that um, I'm making is that I have persuaded myself in doing this stupid kind of crazy suicidal activity so many times that you don't need to make a big change in the world to have a meaningful relationship with it. And hence my model of the slime mold as a form of living life that does not need to be reassured that um, it's going to change the world. It does its thing in a relatively local context. And um, it's something which has uh, the capacity to thrive by seeking out connections and sources of nutrients in a very kind of instinctual way, but where the kind of connection with nutrition, with um, good environments, some causes it to grow faster and to be healthier. And so it's built into um, its natural order of progression is something which is uh, associated with health and thriving. So I like the idea that however tiny or minuscule or absurd my book is, and maybe this applies to you and your projects and your work as artists and designers, however small, in a kind of healthy context where things are looking to connect, there is always the potential for something unusual to happen. And I found this, I don't normally do ultra theory. I've spent a lot of time in my life trying to avoid making obscure statements, but I do love this one so, one so much, is the notion that connects human culture with natural living cultures. So imagine a culture of slime mold or a culture of human activity has no beginning or end. A nomadic system of growth and propagation, it's exposed to a wide array of attractions and influences. So we, that's where we, our work as creative people or as just as citizens of the earth uh, coexists and coincides with natural systems. And we're all in many different ways realizing that we're not really so different from slime mold after all, and that there are therefore causes for reassurance um, when we make that realization. And in my case, although I, I don't know what you're like as creative people, but I can imagine sometimes it feels very lonely or that it's a possibly a kind of pointless activity. In the last two or three years, um, the, the role of the writer in this particular um, non-existent definition category has become less lonely by a rather dramatic way. Um, just last year, a book came out by another fellow writer called Pope Francis, which I don't know if you've followed that at all, but it's a pretty amazing uh, text in many respects. That's probably a tiny bit more copies than mine out there in the world. Um, it's called Our Care for Our Common Home, but it's basically a 700-page explanation as to why our belief systems, the way we think about the world, have framed bad activities, bad faith, bad strategies, bad economic systems, not per se being evil people, but just not thinking about things in a healthy and clean way. And I don't know if you've... No, I am not a practicing Catholic, but I was just completely amazed, partly because Naomi Klein uh, wrote a, a book saying that she, a, a text about how we all had to read it, and I thought I should do that. There's a whole chapter on something called integral ecology, which I know a bit about as a, as a writer and as a, a specialist in the subject, but to find it in the main kind of policy document of the Catholic Church, I think is pretty amazing. And it's basically a statement of what we might all intuitively think, but have it written down there by the leader of this large number of people. A true, I'm going to read it out because I want to have, have it remembered during the day. A true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice and debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And I don't know if you know, there's a man called Leonardo de Boff wrote a book called The Cry of the Earth and the Cry of the Poor, which influenced Felix Guattari and that influenced the Pope. So you have these very, very extraordinary slime mold-like comings together of intellectual and cultural traditions, which have been kind of happening in the background and in lots of different ways, these connections are being made. But every now and again, they burst into the front of one's awareness in a kind of very exciting way. And so then, by the way, this was, I just made this slide for, I went up and down the Seine on a boat during the COP, um, 21 summit, which was rather a depressing event. But it's not just the Pope. These different faith traditions 
have all had discussions and or published policy documents or calls for action or attention um, on the subject of climate change and the role of human beings in having a responsibility to change the way that we are act and live in the world. Uh, China is not a faith tradition, but they have an official policy for their, one of their many long-term things for an ecological civilization, which sounds a bit like a buzzword, but is pretty serious. Everything for the Hindus, a billion, half a million Buddhists, etc., etc. I'm sure I've missed some there. I met somebody literally yesterday who said that the Assyrians have published a text about climate and justice, and I'm sure there are many more. The point being that 75% of the population of the world have now been given formal uh, documents saying, thou shalt think clearly about the role of man, climate, and justice on the planet, which five years ago would have been me and five other sad green people in a pub. So I just think there is something transformative about the scale, but also the clarity and the seriousness of the discussion. And so there, having all this happening, that's, um, that's the environmental movement, you know, white male book writers, that's a little splodge there. We are no longer, we're still lonely and small, but we have a lot more friends to, to keep us company. So that's my way of an introduction to what the book aspires to do. So that was my theory of change, which is that things change in ways that are pretty impossible to plan or anticipate, but that doesn't mean to say change doesn't happen. The next three bits are just a very rapid review of why our challenge seems to be so difficult in making the transition to a sustainable, fair, and livable world. Four ways to reframe the story. And then the main part of my talk is intended to be a rather practical description of how we can organize ourselves to bring the changes around uh, that I'm talking about, accelerate them, and reshape them. So firstly, you know this, but I wanted to just as an exercise remind ourselves as to why, for example, today and yesterday, the press is apocalyptic once more about financial crash and disaster. Why could this be happening? After many years of being a professional but unpopular doomer, I've got it down to one picture, namely this one. This is what we have got wrong in the organization of the world, namely a model of development in which the success and progress of society is measured in terms of the amount of energy and resources we need to kind of carry out our daily lives. On the left is a hunter-gatherer 10,000 or so years ago, a bit of food, a bit of cloth, um, pretty modest needs, all of which could be met from the environment. On the right, um, 10,000 years later, is somebody plumbing up the Shard skyscraper in London, Bodily, pretty much the same, not a big difference in terms of the kind of thermodynamic inputs between them and the, the guy 10,000 years ago. But in terms of needs, civilization, city, lights, cars, transport systems, iPhones, food, frappuccinos, etc., 60 times more energy and resources per body than the guy that um, he replaces. And that sort of escalating gap between then and now is getting faster. Um, amplified by the debt energy nexus, which you've seen and you've heard about this, I guess. The point being that without debt to grow the economy and without energy to run it, things start squeaking at the sh seams and s smoke comes out from under the hood, which is pretty much what's happening this week. Clean energy comes to part two. So I don't know what you've done as artists and practitioners, whether you've studied or been exposed to different theories of what's wrong about the society and the economy we have now. But as far as I'm concerned, in terms of a writer trying to have conversations that open it up, it's just that the frame of the story has always perplexed me. Basically, you have a long list of things which are bad, but we've never had a very clear description of what is the kind of alternative that would resolve the problem. So these words like sustainability, resilience, transition, transformation, these words are all very abstract. And I just don't know what you're like. I cannot get out of bed with enthusiasm and say, today I'm going to work for sustainability. Because I, A, I don't know what the word means, and B, it doesn't turn me on, and C, it doesn't seem to turn anybody else on either. And that's sort of what we've had for the last 20 years, is just abstract words. So four propositions by way 
of a kind of stimulus which gets us to try and rethink the situation. Firstly, a healthy world is not something that is created by us or by an economy and given to other people. It's the property of a social and ecological context. It sounds obvious. It sounds maybe just a self-evident fact, but so much of the language that about how things could be done differently has the word delivery in it. We will deliver a better health service. We will deliver clean energy. We will deliver this and deliver that. And the word deliver is a kind of dangerous code word for some one lot of people will do something for another lot of people, and the second lot will probably have to pay for it. So I want to just, as a kind of provocation, think that whatever this word is, better it's a condition than a word, it's something that emerges from the context that we're all active within, and that what happens to the context is maybe the way we can judge how well we're acting in it. Sustainability or any other words are not things that are going to be delivered like a pizza. Secondly, I love this picture from the French artist Céline Boyer. It sort of symbolizes this all over the place, that the notion that the places we live in is critical to any notion of transition to a healthier future. It's, it's, I think we all understand it very kind of intimately. It's just that we are kind of surrounded by this, uh, you know, the kind of the, the rhetoric and the static and the fog of talk about global systems and abstract forces. Health and well-being are properties of the places we inhabit. Just keep that in mind. I think a lot of things become clearer, as I'll show you later. Thirdly, the health of an ecosystem, whether it's a, a pond or a city or a university or this room, is not about the list of the things or the people or the critters or the flowers inside it. It's about the relationships and the qualities and how well do we connect with each other in a very dynamic way. I just love the graphics here. It's what we used to call eye candy in um, Doors of Perception. But this is basically this Jane Emmert, who's a Canadian biologist, basically, who s looks at the health of ecosystems in which plants, seeds, and various other living things interact with each other. And she does this to demonstrate that it's the, the visitation of one thing to another to get nutrients or pass on information. The density of that is what matters to the health of the place more than a simple shopping list of whether there are yes or no a lot of critters or seeds or plants in the place. It's, it's a huge subject of tremendous importance in the sense that um, people are in various places are trying to say, well, it doesn't matter if we, if we concrete over this meadow because we'll recreate the meadow somewhere else. So all we need to do is write a list of all the plants in the first meadow, and then we'll put those seeds in another meadow, and then we've recreated it. And we can then build the car park, and then meadow will be reproduced somewhere else. I'm, a, I'm oversimplifying, but not much. Her work is demonstrating why that is not a kind of very helpful proposition. And the fourth of my four humble propositions is that we need to get away from the notion of bad men and women or evil, uh, corrupt, uh, sort of Darth Vader type people being the source of our woes. I think that the basic proposition that I find very powerful is that we just lack um, proper cognitive embodied feedback from the state of the nature of which we're a part in the way that we live our lives and indeed the way that we've constructed our civilization. Jason Moore has one of the people who writes a book about the kind of very, very long history of how we've got sort of obsessed and mesmerized by, for example, language or by TV screens or numbers or stock exchange numbers, those t have come to represent the way we judge the health of the world rather than what we experience personally about whether the actual nature or world of which we are part, does, is it yes or no, thriving. So that rift between the economy um, of abstractly measured value on the one side and the real value of nature, that rift is probably the best explanation, it's totally not my observation, of how we have got into this mess through the period of the last uh, several hundred years. So I'm, you know, I'm galloping through a lot of uh, stories here. But if you think about um, a rift that is a fundamental disconnect between the way that we occupy the world and the way we get run our affairs, we need a different story to measure and describe progress, value, success than the one that we have at the moment a story 
that reconnects. Uh, we can discuss later whether storage is the right metaphor, but just something so that when we embark on a course of action, we have a rather easy to understand framework called, is this the right thing to do? Not, is this sustainable? Not, is this transitional? Is this resilient? All these words, they mean nothing to me and I don't think to most people. So I've come across uh, the question, under what circumstances would we be as passionate about nature's internet as we are about man's? So I would like to give you a long spiel about another subject I have new information, the nature of nature's internet, the rhizome, and the fact that underneath our feet in a healthy environment, there is this kind of natural fibrous connectivity between living things, which are Paul Stamets and coined the term nature's internet. It's a kind of, to me, a sort of symbol of the amount of life we are ignorant about, but which is just literally right where stand. That is a metro metabolic lift in one footprint, namely, you go down here long enough, I don't know how badly the, the land is damaged, we will find elements of a living soil, the biggest living system on the earth, which we know me very little about. So it's not about um, saying, oh, it's terrible that we've uh, allowed this to get out of this thing. Under what circumstances, looking forward, would we reconnect with that and take it seriously? That's my kind of rhetorical, you know, practical question. And I think and I've talked to a lot of people about this over the last two years, that if we had a framework for that question, like the health of man, of the nature's internet, in a manageably not too big space, namely the space of the bioregion, I think it becomes, it answers the question, how do we move from something being abstract or too small to something which has a certain coherence? So this is a very beautiful new map of Cascadia, which is one of the centers, where it remains really, um, the center in the sort of modern period of thinking about bioregions, and every now and again a new map is made. The point being that it's kind of exists, it coexists with, you know, administrative maps, political maps, transport maps, the kind of maps that we've used to divide up the land for economic purposes, or to have divide countries from each other, all of which were made by people drawing lines rather arbitrarily on maps, but not paying attention or mindfully understanding the soils, the rivers, the interaction between the land and the sea and so on. So you can't read that, but the, the latest iteration of the Cascadia map, this is, in case you don't know, north of here, uh, north of San Francisco, starts to add more and more of the knowledge that we have about ecosystems and living systems as the research carries on, puts it in a kind of recognizable geographical space. And one can imagine, big, I think one can imagine, and that's what they're saying, looking at bits of that and saying, I would like to look after that. Well, yes, I can, I can imagine that the health of my bioregion is a meaningful way to begin to get people to collaborate who at the moment cannot and will not. So the bioregion is a place that connects people in place. We know that it connects social and ecological phenomena in ways that are natural because that is what is there. But this is where I get a bit sort of schoolmasterish, but just bear with me. If a bioregion um, is healthy, then we are healthy because our health is determined by the environments in which we live. Therefore, for everybody living there, man, woman, human, and non-human, the health of the bioregion is part of our health. It's a common good, not complicated. It is therefore, can't be complicated or controversial to say, we have a shared duty of care for the health of the bioregion, which is what we don't have anywhere at the moment in terms of the ways in which we're called upon to, to devote ourselves to the common good. So I have decided with the, the philosophers and the poets and so on that have been trying to persuade me to see this very obvious statement, yeah, that makes sense. What's wrong with that sense statement? If health is value, health is the most important thing, then the more care we do, for the health of the bioregion, the more value we create. Thereby, we have a new form of value to replace money or the other kind of abstract symbols of health and of value that we've been using up until now. Thereby, so we've had a theory of change, that's my theory of value. And what I try to do in the book, it's not about bioregions, it's really about trying to use that as a trigger for connecting all the small projects that has been my 
pleasure to write about over the last five or ten years, all the different examples in which people, without knowing very much about bioregions or ecosystems or in nature's internet, find ways to look after their daily life needs in ways that are socially just and ecologically healthy, without necessarily always knowing that. So my book and is a kind of question, is yes or no, the bioregion a kind of frame which would make the little project that I go on about, which I get so passionate about, does it make more sense to have that frame around them? So you, the, those are the chapters in the middle. And I think I'll just give you some examples because my proposition is that if the notion of a bioregion or the notion of the health of the land and the soils is something we can agree we all are in favor of, no matter what our disagreements about something else, how do we practically cooperate to increase the health of our place, of our bioregion? That's just a very practical question because I think until we move into those practical questions, it just remains another one of these clouds of abstract propositions. Otherwise stated, what actions and supporting platforms are needed for the bioregion to thrive? That's the kind of question that is actually being put on the table in lots of places, and I'll tell you about that at the end. So what you have in this answer to that question is a world in which in some places people are busily designing, creating, and prototyping economic tools, some such things as local money or collaboration platforms or commons-based governance systems, kind of traditional abstract things, but with a very strong sense that we need to have a kind of framework for organizing our bioregion or our place in new ways. I'm a guessing, if you came tonight, that you'll know about some but not all of those because that's how it works for me. I know quite a lot about the commons. I know quite a lot about transition towns. I don't know much about local money because I, I get a headache when I meet these money experts because they're very, very kind of pernickety and frankly rather sectarian about their different views. The hacker world, some of you will know about, the care economy. I don't know if you've heard all these words, but everywhere you go, there's this kind of cloud of not competing, but coexisting um, ideas about how this mainstream economy is that's killing us can be replaced by other bits. If you're keen, you can go and study this whole thing in the Real Economy Lab, which is a kind of a portal to all the different experiments that are being done. And I went to a meeting of them in Bristol in England before Christmas, and the first time I, my headache receded a bit when one of these brainy people with thick glasses and corduroy trousers said, John, it doesn't matter that we all disagree or that it's all overlapping or confusing because you know, in, in, in nature, diversity is good, he said. So I said, yeah, I suppose so. Well, it's the same in economics. It's the diversity of different propositions is actually a good sign rather than a bad one. And by the way, they will all sort themselves out when they're tested in context. So don't, it's not your job or some expert's job to choose a winner. So that's the economic model side of it. And here's how it works out when I looked for ways in which the models and the bioregion start to come together. I've got no idea at all when I started. I will just keep going. You have to just tell me to stop when you're ready, OK? So let's say uh, well that's one of the chapters on food feeding. What does it mean to look at the relationship between all the small projects that I'm sure many of you know about or have been involved with about food? Is there any conceivable way in which urban farming or helping a child to understand food can change this great big system? And lots of people have that question because it's sort of thing, well, is food just a hipster thing? It's not a serious kind of proposition to changing the big one. Particularly when you look at the backstory of the in gl worldwide growth of a biomedical system of so-called health and wellness in which the economy gets bigger pretty much in step with the amount of fat coming into the food system, a very kind of one of the many brutal examples in which we have, a, you know, have an urban farm here and then we have a global food system which is poisoning and killing us with its, uh, the stuff that it puts into the food that most people have access to. Can it be remotely seriously set out to replace that with a few urban farms. That is the kind of brutal starting point. So um, people have said, well, food systems are very important. We have to think and 
act in systems and not just in terms of projects. And how do we do that? And one of the first starting points is trying to make a visualization of what a food system might be and look like. This is a nourisher in uh, San Francisco. Spent two years or more very kind of hard thinking and trying to find a way to tell the story of the global food system in one image. It's a very beautiful piece of work in the sense that you see how these very diverse things fit together from learning about food, politics, economics, biology, farming, and the inputs and the outputs, and it all kind of fits together. And it's a fantastic thing to look at. The trouble is that it's a starting point, but I don't, uh, it, you could have this in your hand, and then what do you do with this image? What do you do with this image? It's too big. It's too everything. I think what they did, though, very valuable, is to show to everybody you need to have a kind of background knowledge of how the big picture works, but then you need to zoom in to start looking at subsets of what something called a food system is. Namely, in a city, you would have all these types of activities going on, subsystems. But still, one thing you may notice there, it's words and slightly more recognizable activity, but with no actual people doing things. It's still a kind of graph of squirrely lines going round and round and not terribly obvious what you're supposed to do with it. One step further in actually, however, becomes a bit clearer. So this is some uh, friends of mine in Denmark where I gave them the challenge that how would you rec re represent a food system visually in such a way that it was about relationships. If you remember, you know, the aphids are the, the, the relationship Jane Emmett's diagrams, but in a real place with real people doing real stuff. So what they did was <coughs> do a kind of plot of, this is an artist in Denmark, actual activities such as customer enters restaurant or food is stored or somebody composts some things. And then they superimposed on the kind of action, the actions taking place in one town, the different types of organization or groups of people that would be found, a community kitchen, a bakery, a food market, an urban farm, a food truck, and a pig, or a pig farmer, representing real life people doing things to each other. The point being that people doing things to and with each other in that way are the components of a food system and it's possible, once you start to do that representation, to say, well, are there gaps or things missing in the relationships between them that we could maybe fill up? So, for example, does that pig farmer, yes or no, uh, connect with the people running the community kitchen? Maybe there's a missing gap there that by some means, like a project or maybe just an introduction, one could connect people who should be working together but don't know about each other. Because the one thing that is for sure when one looks at these systems in the real world is that there's all sorts of things happening, but people don't know each other or not connected or simply uh, kind of do their thing very beautifully, but do it on their own. And that's where designers come in. And uh, you've all, well, I don't know if you all have, have you, you, are there any service designers here, people who design services? Oh, my God, none. Okay, there's one. You didn't recognize that. You kind of get a picture. These are actors in a place, and you make a big kind of three-dimensional map, and you put an actor, that could be a pig, food truck, um, kitchen, school, and then you see where the gaps are, and then if there's a gap between that and that, you then say, well, by what means, or what action do we need to take to get the pig guy to talk to the food truck guy? That slightly oversimplified, but not much is what service design is about. And in terms of food systems, it's about making the connections that are missing in the industrial system. But, okay, you do that. You have a bunch of uh, designers doing that. How do you then do that all over the place in hundreds and hundreds of different cases, connecting people who are disconnected at the moment? That's where you move from individual projects to a system-wide transformation. That's where the notion of a platform comes in. So a platform basically is a kind of a machine or an organization or a group of people whose job it is to connect people to each other on a more kind of systematic and regular basis. This is what in France called the Food Assembly or La Rouge qui dit oui, which is set up by a, a designer called Guillaume and a, who was actually a chef and an industrial designer who was very frustrated by how kind of tedious and badly organized these schemes are where 
somebody brings you a box of food from the farmer. Surely, Guillaume said, there must be a better way to do food boxes than that. So he created a platform which, if you could see it online, look up the, the food assembly. More than one farmer puts their, I've got beetroots, I've got cheese, I've got milk, onto the website. Members of the club say, okay, I'll have four beetroot, two pints of milk and a cheese. And then at an anointed time and place, the, the citizens go and get the, their food from a central point, and they give the money directly to the farmer. And more to the point, and this is a rule of the game, they have to talk to the farmer and have to say, how's things? Those beetroots aren't very round. What's wrong with them? You general, generate a kind of direct relationship. Um, and the money that the citizen gives to the farmer is 100% goes to the farmer. Whereas if you go into a supermarket and pay $10, the farmer gets 60 cents and $9.40 goes to all the other people, transforms the economic relationship, transforms the social logic, transforms the, the kind of understanding of both sides about what the whole thing's about. And here's another one in uh, Helsinki. Is somebody here from Helsinki? Did I just see? Anyway, there's this amazing urban farm in uh, just south of Helsinki where 100 families all thereabouts join together to grow food, but the point being that, again, it's not that everybody has to become a farmer or a peasant when they're already a web designer or an artist or a mother. They actually have ways of everybody contributes a certain but different amounts of work and expertise and sweat and blood to the operation. And they have a thing called, they have a service platform which measures everybody's input and makes sure that people who do less or do more, that the, the system uh, measures that in a fair way using blockchain technology, which is a software that kind of stops people gaming it. We can talk about that later, but this is where the world of food and the world of people in black t-shirts talking about Bitcoin begins to kind of come together in a very exciting way because they're very often thought to be separate. So you've zoomed in, if you remember from my global food system picture, uh, subsystems and then to real people in the city. then looking at sort of assemblies to connect citizens to growers in a kind of more direct way. But then there's, if zooming back out again, you have things like financial systems, the government regulations. And this is where Larry Yee and his friends from UC Davis, which is also here in California and in other places, have come up with a way to answer the question, how can we organize all these activities as a common good rather than as something that belongs to private companies or is some way or another only driven by the profit motive. That's why the, co the food commons is a, a way to design and build food systems on a regional or bioregional scale. It's pretty amazing. It's kind of only three or four years old, but it's beginning to, it's like the next generation after all the small projects that I mentioned. And it basically says all the different things that happen in a food system anyway. At the moment, we dance to the tune of the big agribusinesses or the supermarkets or whoever, but not for the citizens and the farmers of the place. Reorganizing all of those activities to be at the service of the local economy, the local land. And then uh, after that, finding ways to create you know, money systems, uh, laws, uh, community kind of arrangements, legal entities that help the whole thing to work. It's, a, it's quite abstract at this point, but it, it's abstract from and driven by and for the actual local food project that I was telling you about. And it becomes to get very radical when you see the notion of a food commons, which is system thinking, but in a place, and then these other developments coming from left field. So. Did you, anybody see that in the news last, no, 6th of December? So Finland uh, has voted, they passed a referendum saying that the state will give every citizen 800 euros, roughly $1,000 a month, and do away with the welfare benefits and social security and all of that, on the basis that it's unfair as it's done now, and why not just give everybody enough money to basically live on uh, and do away with the kind of social stigma of being on welfare and so on. This has been a kind of wildcat sort of idea for 20 or 30 years on the far fringes of social theory. Now it's suddenly, because of the kind of weird times we live in, being taken on seriously by a modern country in Europe. And that's, so okay, why not just give everybody $1,000 a month? Good question. The next step, which is also coming from 
the bowels of the European Commission, which not so long ago was the author of all our woes. Well, if we can just give everybody a thousand dollars, why don't we just give everybody food? Why do we have to buy food? Why cannot food be a right, like fresh air, or justice, or schooling, or uh, I don't know, the right to vote? Why does food have to be part of the economy when putting it in the paid economy causes so many uh, bad effects in terms of the wrong logic being used to apply? I'm not saying that this is happening now. I'm just saying that this is now a discussion in policy circles of a completely radical proposal that would have been inconceivable yeah, a couple of years ago. So much is opening up in terms of we have to think the unthinkable. Um, I got, have I got 10 minutes? How, how, did this? Yeah, OK. Um, so I thought since I was in uh, Los Angeles, I should probably at least touch on the subject of moving and cars. And here you have a kind of, you know, there's kind of a, a, a dilemma. An awful lot of people, companies, cultures, films, the history of Hollywood, it's all kind of connected together in the notion of motorized transport as being a symbol of this great city. It's a kind of so many bits and pieces of interests, ecological, I mean, economic and cultural locked together that the idea that you can solve that as I think persuaded many people, it can't be solved and people just go and buy another car. It's like food. It's like water. It's like all these things. It seems to be too big, too complex, too intractable. But people are starting to ask the unthinkable in the same way that they say, why do we have to pay for food? Well, because we do. No, we don't. We, most of history, we didn't pay for food. Under what circumstances? Would 95% of those cars and vans be replaced by two-wheeled or two-footed movement in ways that use 5% of the space and resources we use now? So the first response is, in your dreams. And the second response is, oh, in lots of places, that is beginning to emerge as a very realistic possibility. And as a hint, it's not about cars but about networked ecosystems. I actually got taken up the hill in San Francisco by somebody in a Tesla S, is it called? There's only three in the world. And my basic total life story about Teslas is that large, heavy, shiny things are not and cannot and never will be green. Uh, so it's not about things, vehicles. It's about something else. It's how we connect together all the bits of the vehicle, bits of what people do, communication system, objects and information, which are already there in the city, but used in very perversely inefficient and illogical ways. Can we, the proposition goes, rewire them all together so that we use far, far, far less objects and information and money and space? And with a very explicit objective called using 95% resources to achieve the same amount of mobility, which actually is doable today if you look at the amount of energy required to walk and bike a kilometer or a mile compared to all the other methods of movement. We can do that today. It's just that there are lots of reasons why we think that's not a viable system for the whole of a city or for the whole of a country. But it's not like we have to invent something new in terms of vehicles to achieve our objective. We have uh, started along this road. I remember I took an Uber when I was here last time, three or four years ago, and I thought, this is fantastic. This is a miracle. We will now do away with the inefficiency of having cars that sit unused for 95% of the time, thanks to this marvelous thing called Uber. Five minutes later, Uber has become the devil itself, so I'm told. So the same operation which looked so cool when I was here before it's now kind of ruining the lifestyles of the cities and the drivers and the people. Anyway, it's a big debate. The point being that Uber is a dramatic response to only one part of the question. At this other end of the scale, you have sailing ships for cargo. This is not per se at the center of my story, but I love, the, I love this whole project so much. It's set up by farmers. Have you heard of mainsail freight, anybody? It's a beautiful project. Anyway, look it up. 
Um, more to the point, in Belgium, where this notion of wiring together existing assets is becoming serious, a project called Mobilitope, which is a kind of government plus city plus industry thing, used this van as a symbol of uh, a piece of an artifact being used for multiple different purposes. So the, the, the lights on the top say taxi, pickup, delivery, assistant, vendor, security, rental, whatever. The idea is the same van used for lots of different functions, depending on who has accessed it um, in what way and at what time. And that's a van, which is a mo motorized, light, but still motorized. In Germany and uh, in Austria, there's a completely serious and rather um, profound policy change called how do we move 80% of the goods and um, heavy uh, objects that are currently delivered around cities in trucks onto two-wheeled vehicles with or without some sort of electric assist. And there's this whole kind of catalog of types of bicycle that can be used for liquids or for foods or for chilled things and so on. That guy on the right is a food, a soup company in Zurich who uh, used to run a, a restaurant, but the kind of rents that he was paying for the restaurant, heard this a thousand times, got out of control, thought about food trucks and having a soup food truck, but then discovered that the legislation in Zurich prohibits people from parking and selling soup, but the regulations do not permit a two-wheeled vehicle from doing that. So you now have a two-wheeled soup kitchen, 10 or 12 of them, all over Zurich. So you have lots of kind of bits and pieces of the puzzle emerging. And then last November, I went to uh, this extraordinary presentation in Vienna of a thing called Movel, which is uh, a platform device system uh, created by Daimler, the Mercedes company, which says we will join all those little bits together so that with one press of the button, you can take a tram, a bus, a sailing ship across the city with your goods. We move, we Daimler will connect them all together. And it's a very, very smart piece of, uh, I don't know what it's called, engineering and service design and system integration in which all those bits can be accessed and used, if you remember, like the van on the top right, the system connects you to them so that you have to do no hustling around buying different tickets and negotiating rides. All that's done you, for you by the system. Except that when this presentation was made, the head of the transport in Vienna said, well, this is amazing and very handy because it's very complicated, uh, but actually, do we want to hand over this service to a private company like Daimler so that it's the same as handing over ride sharing to Uber. Same danger is that the success for Daimler Movil is the more traffic and the more movement and the more stuff, the better, because they make a cut off every transaction. Whereas maybe if the city was the owner of the machine, they, they might say, we want less cars full stop or less movement. We could turn the slider down. And there, it's actually the common good of the people and the city becomes the owner of the machine and not Daimler. And so everybody said, well, this is fine, very theor very nice and very idealistic. But at the end of the day, it's the, the city of Vienna is not about to be as capable of Daimler in building such a platform for the common good, except that somebody stood up at the back and said, actually, by the way, we can look no further. It's already happening. Meanwhile, at the same moment as that meeting in Vienna about uh, Movil, in Israel, these four guys are developing a platform called Lazoos, which does for collaborative transport what Movil does, but without having a profit motive and without it having to be about, you know, the more traffic, the better. And it's just the sort of disruption that it's like two and a half generations of disruption after Uber within like, what, 18 months. It's just so fast. And what Lazoos does, uh, I don't know, these are the list of the kind of architectural features of the thing. It's a decentralized platform so that it doesn't operate out of a kind of office. It's kind of shared across the network. It's owned by the community of the people, the drivers, the passengers, anybody who participates as a member of the club can be a co-owner of it. It does what the other ones does, which is use vehicles that are otherwise not used. But it gets really exciting because it has in it a kind of software and the rules and regulations so that everybody who takes part, such as a software developer, 
or a designer or a vehicle owner is rewarded for their fair share of participation by a kind of algorithms and social rules guaranteed by cryptocurrency technology so it can't be fiddled. You can't lie to it, you can't kind of game it, you can't fiddle it, which is the promise of cryptocurrency and blockchain. So you have there the answer to the question of the commons, which has perplexed people for the last 60 or 70 years. What do you do when people cheat, don't pull their weight, don't really do as much as the next guy in that commons-based activity? In Lazoos, you have a combination of very ancient forms of social duty combined with technology to help people do the right thing, which may conceivably unlock what they call the tragedy of the commons. We shall see. Can it be reproduced? Can it be multiplied? Well, I'm an optimist because I hang out with people doing positive things. With this stuff, I get really optimistic because I can see that it begins to address this real question that people have is that lots of little nice things are nice, but don't really give you the confidence that they can replace the big bad machine. And I think there are certain elements that uh, I think put on the table to draw this to a close. Um, one can imagine in a rather simple way as a, an organizer of events and activities, uh, putting together to make this sort of thing doable in our own contexts. I told you this notion of place. So there are lots of ways of imagining a unique place. A bioregion is one. It could be a watershed. It could be the food shed of a city. It could be all sorts of things. It's something that one can discuss that as long as you say we are collectively focusing our agendas, our solidarity, and our love on one place rather than on an abstract idea. I think that's a powerful start. Maybe we need a guru. This is my new guru, who is a Danish uh, man in one of the first hipsters. And I saw a friend of mine came in with a beer tonight. It's not as good as that, is it, Casey? But anyway, you're getting there slowly. Um, Nikolai Grundtvig was the founder of the folk high school movement in Denmark, and he basically was one of the first people, uh, beginning of the 20th century, to say, if we do our education in locked rooms and in darkened chambers, sitting in serried ranks in front of lecturers and teachers, we will not make progress. And so he said, I want to have folk high schools located, not in city centers, but in the countryside, so that we can connect people to the land through new forms of inquiry. So that's the the guru. We need to be grounded in our projects. So if you remember, I said under what circumstances would we take care of nature's internet as much as human being, our own cool kind of techie one? I used to think this was a very tall order and that basically you, me, were just that we would intellectually understand but not be turned on by it until in Sweden last year we had the Doors of Perception summer school with 40 pretty urban architecture and design types. And <coughs> we said to them on day one, yeah, under what circumstances would you lot find soil meaningful and engaging and enticing? And after a week of buzzing around the island of uh, Grinda, they came back with this extraordinary food tasting ceremony in which what they'd done was to um, go and find different plants and trees around the island and take the leaves and make a tisane, which you can see, I think, a bit in the big glasses. And then next to the tisane, a dry sample of the soil in which the plant had grown. And the, the ritual was drink the tisane and then taste with your finger the soil and then compare the taste of the plant and the tisane to the soil and see what conclusions you come to. In complete silence and with no kind of instructions or kind of lists of anything, so powerful and amazing, not just because I, yeah, we all got it immediately, we're connecting our body and our taste to the plant, and that, but that this lot had kind of made this beautiful sort of ritual of reconnection. So it's like pushing at an open door. It's one of those subjects which I just know is not a hard sell. It sounds complicated. Soil, love, hands-onness, absolutely crucial. Digging things and fixing things, not just like drawing pictures of healthy rivers, but physically getting down and dirty and doing it. It's so powerful every time I've been involved. In the open air, this is one of our groups, in uh, one of our ex-school groups, 
the very act of being outside just seems to create a sense of shared ownership of a question in ways that, you know, a thousand books and lectures will never do. This is our school in Sweden, where we go every summer. Admittedly, a rather beautiful picture compared to the weather we had this year, but anyway, it's a very nice, I use that one when inviting people to come, rather than other ones. It's not about people leaving the town, becoming peasants or becoming artists of the countryside. It's about creating places and organizational forms and arrangements to make it possible to have both. Because the big lesson I've learned in the last period is that expecting people to drop everything and become uh, rural people is not realistic or even necessarily a good idea. But at the same time, a lot of people are very scared of being trapped in the city without any possibility of participating or engaging or having any part of life outside. We need to design hybrids of those. And that's, I think, is the task that I think is very exciting for the future again. We can use ways of rewarding each other and exchanging value. It doesn't have to be about money. This is the Mozilla badges. The Lazoos guys have tokens. We can exchange benefits, exchange value, exchange um, gratitude in ways that are not only reducible to dollar bills, because there's lots of people out there doing that. And then we have the kind of platforms to make it happen. So that's what I think is where these bits come together, whether it's food or water or transport, the common good, shared ownership of the whole platform, um, and a kind of common a commitment to do in small but meaningful ways practical things to make our places healthier. Those are the elements. If you're keen, I've got a couple of courses that our group is doing. We ought to do more of these. Um, Back to the Land 2.0, that's our kind of slogan for this year, um, if X cool. Thank you. Here comes the mic. Rebecca has one. I remember I went to um, to one of the events that was by the Netherlands Design Institute where you were director at that time. And it was designer as editor. <coughs> we have heard many other things, designer as producer, designer as this. So what would you call this designer as what? I kind of retired uh, from trying to define things in a clear way, because as soon as I say the designer as what the situation will change, it's basically the rule is try not to think about the designer doing anything on her own, but doing it with and for and you know in conjunction with somebody else. So that stuff about the connections, the Jane Emma, you know, the fundamental patterns of a healthy ecological community is the pattern of relationships between bugs and plants and nutrients and air, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can measure the health of a design culture in the same way. How well are we kind of collaborating with and doing stuff with other people? So in this context, uh, you know, if it's in a university context or in a, in a research context, how well are we interacting with people who know things that we don't? I don't know, botanists nuclear physicists, I think it doesn't really matter. But more important to me is how well are we looking outside the, you know, the campus or the abstract environment to have real world connections. Because I just think that the real world is where the questions are, to put it neutrally. So and that's not all the time, but we should be connecting to communities and situations that are troubled and need our attention, because that's where we can do the, the most good or make the biggest difference. And whether it's as an editor or as a connector or as a transformer, I don't, yeah, it'll vary. A maker, yeah, a maker's, you know, making brings a lot of those things together. But lots of people are makers who aren't designers, or, or maybe they are, but they don't think about it. I think we should take the weight of, off our shoulders of trying to define what we do by a label and just say, make a description of the activity. Say, does this activity sound healthy for our place? Is it likely to leave things better or worse when we've done this thing? And then it's not that we're going to be right all the time, but put that question at the beginning. And then secondly, do we have the right kind of mix of skills and people and energies in this activity or project that we probably need for it to be a, a good one? That's what I would say. 
there are some people who believe that the way to change Can is to... Can you tell me your name just so Oh, I yes. Can, yeah. I, I'm Sienna. Sienna. Hi. Um, so some people believe that the way to make change is through policy. So to work with the government and like if they were to make actual laws um, that we'd have no choice but to follow them. Uh, so you seem to be focusing on what the community can do. Do you think that the way to bring change overall is for the community to be so strong that the government has no choice but to change and do what they want or for the community to like, have middlemen between policy and the layperson? So if you heard that, there was a, uh, the question was about what, what is the uh, importance or otherwise of policy making as the framework of the way that governments think that they shape our activities in the future direction of the world. My own, uh, uh, I used to be a kind of a policy maker on a s small scale, but I just got burned out and depressed by the relative amount of work to, compared to how much difference anything seems to make. And also, policy makers, have a, they're much worse than university people. They're totally isolated from the subjects that they make policy about. They live in the bubble of parliaments and think tanks and uh, you know party political stuff. So the opportunity in terms of time and place for them to get feedback from the actual world, the help, you know, the living world is terribly small. So I don't, it's not that I feel sorry for them, but they are just not well placed at all to do policy making in a good way. But it's not to say that it's not important, but I tend to think that bottom up and top down should, in a healthy situation, feed on each other. And that the m I have just chosen to deviate towards bottom up because that's why I have more fun and I get less depressed. Um, but some brave and kind of sacrificing people will become policy makers and elected officials. But I just tend to think that they are, they are, so to speak, the result of what happens on the ground and not the cause, at the, certainly at the moment. A big subject, but, and that's a sweeping statement as well. But uh, you know, I just think the policy making is a kind of a misnomer at the moment. It's reacting to things that people don't know what to do about. You need a microphone in your name. Okay, my name is Paulina. Um, I have a question that relates a little bit to that, and it's something that has been churning around in my head. Uh, I'm doing a certificate in sustainability. Um, I'm trying to understand exactly what it encompasses, but it's about infrastructure. I agree with your topic on which people are not mean. We just actually react, in my opinion, to our beliefs plus our infrastructure. For instance, the use of garbage, right? Like people think that they should recycle, but when there's no infrastructure for recycling, we just throw everything together, no matter how nice people we are. And like, it's very difficult for somebody to actually, in lack of infrastructure, go and, re and recycle. Same with companies, you know, they throw garbage in the seas or in the river, whatever, because they feel, what else are we going to do? There's nowhere for us to put this thing, or there's no way of, this is what was in the past. So. Um, it's just been turning in my head, like how can governments or private enterprise or something actually create that infrastructure so that we uh, end up behaving as our best, not as our worst, just because we don't have another way of doing it? It's a great question. <coughs> I mean, I personally think that infrastructure is a social thing rather than a physical thing. So it's not as if we lack, I don't know, receptacles to, well, lots of countries are busily kind of changing the physical arrangements for what, how to manage waste, but at the end of the day, the places in the world where waste is either not an issue or where it's sorted itself out as well is when society has organized itself in a very collaborative way to just deal with the problem bit by bit. So the question of uh, food waste, I mean, in France at the moment where I live, uh, the government has passed a law called supermarkets are not allowed to throw away food that they haven't sold. And it's a good example of that fantastic because it's a result of a lot of social pressure and people having marches and writing books and newspaper articles but nobody has said and what are they what are they supposed to do with all this food that they are not allowed to throw away and t you know one doesn't frequently feel sorry for the supermarket business but on this occasion I actually do because the, the law was suddenly passed but the, what you do then is something which will not be a global solution but lots of diff depending on the situation so where I live in a smallish town we have three supermarkets, and they will have skips of food potentially needing to be something happening to them. We have to go and have a discussion with them. Is it something for farming? Is it for composting? Is it for kitchens? Is it for poor people? Is it for, uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but the notion that the supermarket sits there with a headache saying, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? That's the wrong model of infrastructure called pass a law, and then the government sort of wish washes its hands off it. We need a fantastic 
outburst of social creativity to figure out what to do now that the supermarkets have been in, uh, commanded to behave in a better way. So they, be they have to behave better, but then we have to be part of the next step, I think. And one can then look at 101 models around the world of different things that can be done, which exist, but we need to search for them. I'm Zareen. Please um, hold it there, so yeah. I'm Zareen. <coughs> you had um, the idea of basic income and the commons in one slide. They're, they're quite opposite. And um, I guess I w I w I'd like a bit clarification on um, a term that I haven't heard is used as post-scarcity. And how does that, is it relate to, does it overlap with the commons? Because, you know, do they call me a little bitch? <laughs> um, and yeah, I lost my train of thought here. So, 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 so the Post yeah guess. basic income is, is something that opposes the idea of the commons. I'm for either one of those two. I don't. I it probably does, but but then remember, yeah, how does it relate with the I idea don't know of the answer. I just the I just a, if you remember, I had that slide with all those blobs dotting around. Uh, which is the the new econ the real economy lab, mm -hmm. and, the co and then another one with a kind of light bulb with different words like commons, sharing, transition towns. There's lots of competing and coexisting uh, experiments and models out there, none of which fit neatly together uh, into an alternative to the system or the systems that we have now. I just think that what we need is two things. One is we we need to agree on some sort of principle called whatever else our agreements or disagreements, can we agree that we want to leave our place healthier rather than unhealthier when we've done our thing or lived our lives? Because at the moment, where a lot of people say, let's do less harm. And, and doing less harm in a growing economy means that you do more harm, by the way. But that's a sort of shift called whatever else our disagreements about practice, let's say we want to leave our, our bioregion healthier or our city healthier. Then you say, okay, our, what are the ways in which we might do that? And that's where you need new forms of uh, civic uh, discussion forums that are not based on endless talking shops, but finding ways in which we can all participate and experiment to say, is a commons-based approach practical for transport in Vienna? Just yes or no, what does it mean? And that's what they're actually having that discussion now. Um, and then is a basic income for everybody paid for out of taxes, is that consistent, yes or no, with a commons-based approach to food? And it's the it's to do with getting away from the notion of policy makers. Policy makers should sort out these very big, high level questions, and the rest of us should then just do what we're told. I think we have to be part of that discussion. And the discussion should be a very practical one that's doing experiments that uh, we can see what works and what doesn't work. I know it's probably not a good answer, but there's, there's so many absolutes being competing for attention. I don't think that what comes next, if it's a good next, will be any absolutes. It'll be a mixture of things, varying tremendously from place to place. So in some areas, you'll have a commons-based kind of way of farming. And in other places, it may, may be something quite different. But it's to do with how we then set the health of the land and the health of our place at the top of our list of priorities. Well, the idea of food as a commons, I hadn't I didn't heard of that. It's not widespread. I yeah. don't want to suggest that it's all about to be happen tomorrow. It's just no. the lo I didn't think that this universal basic income would, in my lifetime, be introduced at all. It's been a pretty fringe thing for a long time. Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm asking because it's it's these ideas are fringe ideas, and I'm wondering if it's a matter of semantics as well that makes them fringe when you say post scarcity suddenly, r rather than using the term commons. Because to I me just think that the the the, l the reality that we live in is so extreme at the moment in terms of the things that are happening and unfolding and you know falling to pieces that fringe and ed edge edges are pretty much the one place where you will find promising ideas and solutions because all the stuff in the mainstream has been shown or either been shown not to work or has been co-opted and distorted so I think that it's fairly natural to have things coming in from the edge and for sure the more insightful and realistic of the quote, policy makers, that they're looking to the edges as well. They, they've tried everything else. They're desperate for something fresh and new and interesting.
particular things where they don't have to do all the work. That's the, the one thing that policy, they, they, they can't deliver solutions to all this mess. So they want us to be part of reorganizing how we care for each other, how we care for the land, how we provide food and everything else. So it's a, it's a shared endeavor. Which, by the way, when it happens well, it just creates so much happiness and good feeling. So it's not, you know, it's not actually so bad. In, this, if you, in, in abstract from examples, it sounds unrealistic. I accept that. That is it. That is it. Thank you.